All right, so welcome back. All right, so let's go ahead and see how far we get done with today. Again, tomorrow, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, if we didn't finish the study guide, we'll finish it up. And then any questions at all in the course of everything that we learned from chapters all the way up to, all the way up to 11. Anything that you wanna ask, you let me know because that's what tomorrow is going to be. Um, and, um, most likely expect that tomorrow will probably be a short day. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started here with the lower cost of market. So use the following information to answer, uh, question 20. Um, in this case, um, I don't have question 20, so ignore that. So here, um, we have original price of an item that we bought for $4.75 each. Um, and right now it's asking to be replaced at $4.05. It's selling price is $10.50, right? And, it, and the cost to dispose this item is $1.33. Um, the amount of profit that we want to gain out of it is at least $3.55. So let's go ahead and determine the ceiling, floor, uh, market, and which one's lower. All right, so... Let's get started. If you guys don't remember how to do this, pull out your review sheet and it should be on the chapter six review sheet. Okay. So how do we solve for ceiling price? Good. Good. So how much am I looking at here? Nine seventeen. Nine seventeen. Okay. All right. And then how do we solve for the floor? Okay, so in this case, how much do I get from here? 562. All right, 562. Now, how do I determine my market value? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. 562, right? Because we're going we're gonna to take those three numbers. We're going to place it in numerical order. Which one's the highest? Obviously, 917, right? It's their ceiling. Which one's, which one's the bottom? So in this case, we're dealing between our uh, replacement cost and our floor cost. In this case, my floor cost is higher than... Then my replacement, making my replacement going to be the bottom number, right? It's going to be the lowest number there. So my mentality is I'm going to take the number that falls into the middle, which is the market value going to be $5.62, okay? And then lastly, I'm going to compare two numbers. So which one's lower, the original cost or the market value? And in this case, it is the original cost of 475 is lower. So I'm going to go ahead and that is my answer. C. Good. All right. Any questions about lower cost of market? Okay, so this is supposed to be chapter six. I uh, mislocated it, but that's okay. It's, it's there. Yes, did you say something, um, Anna? Mm, no, I was saying that for my... Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. So, now we're going to be moving on to Chapter 9, which was all about um, petty cash and establishing one. So, here, use the following information to answer the next question. So, on... 
January 1st, you establish a petty cash fund for $500. All right, by the by January 31st, you counted all of your receipts, and here they all are. So we bought a birthday cake, okay, so we were celebrating someone's birthday. We got some pizza going, and we got some office supplies, and we also had to pay for some postage stamps, okay? Getting us a total right here. So by looking at this uh, right here, so the question here is, for what amount do you need to write a check for to replenish your petty cash fund? B, $60.54. Let's add up the total. So $19.99 plus $23.78 uh, plus $6.02 uh, plus $10.75. Can someone confirm with me that the answer is $60.54? Yes. Perfect. So yes. You write a check for the amount of total receipts that you have because at the end of the day, we still have, what, 400 and roughly $440 left in our petty cash. So you want to make sure that you write a check for the amount of total receipts that you have counted, all right, to bring our petty cash back up to $500 or in this case, make sure that the amount equals up to $500. Good. Question number 36 is going to ask you, um, how do you establish a petty cash fund? Good. So this is an exact question from your quiz, except in different order. Um, so again, you're going to debit a petty cash fund and credit your checking. Wait, is that what you said, Lynette? You said it was A? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. All right. That's how you establish a petty cash fund, right? You're going to debit the petty cash and you're going to credit your checking. All right. Good. Number 37. Okay. How do you replenish a petty cash fund? Okay, so we got someone answering B. A. We got A. Okay, so yes, we're not going to debit all the receipts in the lockbox because you're not going to debit receipts, right? Because that, that's the total amount that you have, right? We're going to write a check for the amount of the total receipts in there in order to replenish. Okay, so the key word here is to replenish the petty cash fund. But I do see how A can be confusing because that's how you actually are supposed to record it, right? You're supposed to debit your receipts and you credit it with the check amount. But in this case, my question is to how to replenish it, not journalize it. So B is the correct answer. You're going to write a check for the total amount of receipts in the lockbox. You're never going to write a new check for a larger amount of petty cash, okay? And um, definitely you're not going to count the petty cash fund and write the check for the same amount, okay? Because then you're going to increase the petty cash fund, right? Any questions in Chapter 9, right? So all I really want you to know is how to establish it and how to replenish it. That's all I need you to know. So you can already assume that quite for chapter six, chapter nine, there's only like one or one or two questions. Okay. Chapter 10 is where we move into receivables, our bank reconciliation, as well as our time value of money. So in this case, let's go ahead and answer the question. So under which method does the IRS um, use to write the bad debt? 
for tax purposes only. So we answered this one. A, the allowance method. Okay, no. Again, remember, read carefully for the IRS. Right, but the question is asking which method do, uh, do the IRS use for tax purposes only? <laughs> so, so it, yes, so it's the direct write off, yes. So we remember we learned two ones, one of them's for tax purposes, and the other one is for regular accountants. In this case, the question is asking. Um, which method does the IRS use to write off bad debt for tax purposes only? And that is going to be the direct write-off method. So tax accountants, the IRS, whoever it is, they use the direct write-off. Okay. So here's more examples of this right here. So 39, a company estimates that 43 thousand eight hundred and eighty seven dollars of its five hundred thousand dollars accounts receivable okay is uncollectible there is currently a debit balance of five thousand dollars in the allowance for doubtful accounts so how do we record this adjustment right Let's start off with what account are we going to be using? Allowance for doubtful accounts. What kind of account is that? First, we're going to recognize bad debt expense. Yes, that's number one because we need, we're need we writing off the bad debt, right? We reach the end of the period. This is an adjustment entry. So bad debt expense. Okay, and then, Lynette, now we use the allowance for doubtful accounts, okay? Another way, another key uh, to kind of figure this one out is we already know that allowance for doubtful accounts is a contra account, and it should have a credit balance at the end of the day. All right, so for my scenario, how much am I going to determine my total amount of bad debt to write off or to adjust for? B, 39,887. Yes, 39,887, right? We're going, we recognize there's a debit balance in my allowance for doubtful accounts. So with that, it's gonna, it's gonna trigger me to say, I need to add. So 34 plus 5,000 is 39,008. Eight seven is correct, um, and uh, I should copy that over here as well. Okay, so yes, B is correct. Okay, same scenario, except this time there's uh well, let me just read it. A company estimates at three thirty four thousand eight hundred and eighty seven dollars. Of its 500000 total credit sales is uncollectible. There is currently a credit balance of $5,000 in the allowance for doubtful accounts. The adjustment entry will be... Bad debt expense. Bad debt expense. Allowance for doubtful accounts. Good, right? Now, but for how much now? C, no. A, A thirty-four Because of the total credit sales? Total credit sales, which indicates what method are we using? Balance sheet or income? Income statement method? 
income statement method. And when we recognize income statement method, do we care if there's even a balance in our allowance for doubtful accounts? No. no. So in this case, right, total credit sales, your accounts receivable and your allowance for doubtful accounts will never appear on the income statement. Okay? Never appear. So therefore, all we don't even care about what the balance is. All we care about is our estimated amount. All right. Good. 34887 is correct. Here, another example. So it's, is now it's going to be a company estimates that $34,887 of its 500,000 accounts receivable is uncollectible. There is currently a credit balance of $5,000. So now what is my adjustment entry going to look like? Good. For this time, what is my amount going to be? 29887. 29887. Now we actually care about the balance in the allowance of doubtful accounts because now we recognize the word accounts receivable, right? We know that just by this, we're doing the balance sheet method. And of course, the balance sheet, if there's an if there is an account receivable, your contra account should also appear, which is your allowance for doubtful accounts. So you do care whether there's a credit or a debit balance in there. In this case, there's a credit, so we know that we need to subtract to get us to the grand total of 34,887. In order to do that, we're going to take 34, subtract the 5 to get us 29,887. So in this case, C is the correct answer here. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I just have to throw this one in. Lastly, um, um, same scenario, except this time, 34887,000 8, of its 500,000 total credit sales is uncollectible. There's currently a debit balance in the allowance for doubtful accounts for $5,000. So what is my adjustment entry going to look like? Same. Same thing, except what's my total amount going to be? 34. Good. Oh, 34, not 24. 34, 8, 8, 7. Okay, why? Same thing, we're dealing with the total credit sales, which indicates we're using the income statement, which in concludes we don't care about the balance in the allowance for doubtful accounts. We only care about the estimated number. Okay, good. So I exhausted you guys with this concept. <laughs> All right. Now is going to be our bank reconciliation. Yay. So with this one, again, it's not going to look anything like this, but this is just what happens in real life. You're going to get a bank statement, and you can compare it to your cash ledger. And cash or checking register, whichever one that your company uses is what you're going to be utilizing for this. So here is a perfect example of a uh, real life bank statement. Well, not really real life, but what it should look like. Okay. And I also included your cash ledger, which also includes your check register and as well as your deposits for the month. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's decide are we going to do the bank side or are we going to do the cash side first? Let's do the bank, so, so we'll move from left to right. So in this case, we got to start off with our ending balance in our bank. So I'm going to go back to my bank statement. And what does it say? 1088 is going to be our um, ending balance. So 
eight, eight, all right? Now, because I'm dealing with the bank side, what am I going to be adding first? Deposit. Deposit. So I'm going to go ahead and look at my deposit slips right here or my deposit um, register, and I'm going to count... I have a total of five deposits, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and go to my bank statement and tell me which one is missing. Four eighty three. So I'm going to put eight thirty deposit. Or since I only have one for four eighty three dollars, is that right? Four eighty three. Good. Four eighty three. Okay. What am I going to be subtracting from my bank? No. 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 Your outstanding check. Your outstanding check. So remember, okay, I have to focus on my dues on my bank side. So outstanding check. So I'm going to go to my check register. All right. How many checks did I write? How many checks did I write? Eight. I wrote a total of eight. Let's check my bank now. How many checks did, how many checks cleared in my bank? Count again, Lynette. In this case, NSF means non-sufficient funds. It didn't return. You just didn't have enough money in your bank. So they, they, they pushed it forth. Meaning they paid for it. But you owe the bank money now. So in this case, what check numbers am I missing? Six and seven. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my check register. And how much for the amount of my six and seven? So 50, wait, fifth. Okay, so three. So uh, I'm missing 106 and 107. So 3, 14, and 54. Giving me a grand total of how much? All right. Can someone calculate for me the grand total that I'm supposed to be having in my bank? 1,203. 1,203? Okay, all right. So now we're gonna be dealing with our cash side. So let's, the first thing we need to start off is our ending balance, which you would find that in your cash ledger or checking account. So in this case, on um, August 31st, what is the total amount of cash I have in, the, in my ledger? Eleven fifty-three. Here, let me make it smaller so you guys can see. So eleven fifty-three is what I started out with in my bank. Eleven fifty-three. All right. What do I need to add first? Interest. And if I have one. 
A C A C H. So, do I have that in my bank? One through pay in, one or where's pay into credit? So in this case, yes, I do. I have it in my bank. I'm looking at my bank statement, and I have ACH for 125, and I have interest collected for 75. Okay, so interest was 75. ACH was 125. Give me a grand total of $200, right? What about my... What am I subtracting from my cash ledger? Good. So let's go back up to my bank statement. Did I get charged for service charges? Yes, I did for $100. And then here I got an NSF fee because I had non-sufficient funds. So I have to pay $50 for that. So in this case... Um, I'm going to indicate here service charge for a hundred dollars and NSF for fifty. So giving me a grand total of how much one fifty. Okay, so can someone add up the totals? Twelve. Twelve oh three even. Good. And do they match at the end of the day? Yes. Okay. So I'm making this bank reconciliation as simple as possible. So the ending balance is going to be 12.03, all right? All I want you to know is your dues and your ifs, okay? So dealing with your deposits and outstanding checks and your interest as well as fees, so NSF fees. And that's all I want you to know. Pretty straightforward and simple, okay? I don't want, to, I don't want you to spend... Uh, 20 or 30 minutes looking through every single check that you've written or every single um, cash entry that you've written to solve for this answer, okay? Because we have, this test is supposed to be four hours long, so I don't want you to spend too much long, too many hours on it, okay? Now, number 44, we're going to be looking at simple interest. So, Let's get started here. So um, you bought a bank bond worth 200000 and its um, annual simple interest is going to be 7.75%. Um, and it could be redeemed at any time. However, how long are you going to, uh, how long will the bank be worth in 10 years? So you can redeem at any given time, but... We're going to be looking at a projection here. We're going to predict how long it will it be worth in 10 years. So in this case, how do I solve for my interest? Principal times rate times 10, which is how much, Tennyson? Uh, you mean the answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's my interest? Uh, interest is uh, I mean, uh, fifteen percent. I, I got the answer to the three fifty four. Three? Oh, you? Oh, you? You solved for the full thing? It's one, your interest is one fifty five. Fifteen thousand five hundred per year. And uh, into ten, hundred fifty five thousand plus two hundred. Okay, so, so my interest is just only going to be a thousand five hundred, a thousand fifty five. No, this is just. 
at the end of 10 years. This is how much interest I'm going to collect at the end of 10 years. But the question it is asking here is, how much is my bond going to be worth in 10 years? So that's where I add my principal, which is 200, to get me $355,000. Okay? Right? Any questions in that? It's I only want you to do that much calculations. I just need to make sure that you know how to solve for the interest, right? It's going to be principal times rate times time. And then I want you to solve for the future value, which is going to be your principal plus your interest. Okay. So in this in this case, the answer is three thousand three hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. All right, now here's a credit card company lets you, okay, so this is just an example in case you wanted to learn um, to do compound interest. It's up to you if you want to complete it. I'm not going to test you on it, but this is just for practice purposes only. So do you want to do it or you want to skip it? It's up to you. You want to do it? All right, so if you guys have Excel, make sure you guys have that available because you will not be able to do this on a regular calculator. Okay, so in this case, let me get a new sheet. So in this case, my question here that is asking is that a, a credit card lets you borrow a total of $500, okay? Um, and its interest rate is going to be 28.9%, all right? And it's going to be compounded every month. How much interest will be collected at the end of two years, okay? Say, assuming that you're going to, they give you the whole, uh, what do you call it, 0% interest on two years or whatever they call it, or they tell you, oh, you can pay them back within the two years. So how much interest would you collect over those two years if your interest is going to be 28.9%? That's a very high rate. And that, I will tell you, TJ Maxx, you need to care, be careful and read their guidelines because they do charge 28.9%. Yes, any retail is anywhere up to 24 to 30% mm -hmm, interest, and you have to pay it every month. So let's go ahead and calculate this. Uh, so I have my P, which is 528%, 12 months, and two years. So in this case, I'm going to blow this up a little bigger so you guys can see. My formula is going to be what? What is my formula going to be? So what's my principal? Let's do one, one, one number at a time. 500. Okay, so that's my P. What is my next part of my equation? Times, oh, okay, good, one, plus, rate, which is what? So, 0 0.289, 12, good, number of times compounded. Mm -hmm. number, number. Which is 12. What do we need to go before that? Well, it's the carrot sign. 12 times...
Uh-huh. Okay. So in this case, my future value is going to be 800 uh, $885.15. So what is my total interest I'm going to be collecting after it's been two years? Anybody? Three eighty five fifteen. If you so, what's the formula for um the good? So there you go. Eight three eighty five fifteen is your answer okay so make sure that you read carefully and make sure if you're answering the question that it will ask okay so in this case the first one asks what is the total value going to be in the future right at 10 years and this one's asking how much interest are you going to be collecting okay so in this case um it was 885.15 making it 385.15 for the interest and I just wrote in the wrong box so 385.15 and my um, future value is 885.15 okay good okay so chapter 11 let me see what time it is right now to see if we're good on time okay so it's 11.09 so, let me see, one, two, three. Let's go ahead and answer the next four questions, and then we'll stop there and then continue tomorrow. So, 46 says, um, what fixed assets can never be depreciated? So, again, this is from your quiz as well. Land, except this time I changed it. I got street, la street lights. Yes, those definitely can be depreciated. So land is correct. Number 47, fixed assets are depreciated. Intangible assets are A, amortized. Yes, so you see how I asked you the same exact question in a different way? Expect that as well. Number 48 says, if a machine was put into service on January 19th, when do you start depreciating it? C, February. Good. All right. Um, and then number 49, gap determines what two components for depreciation? D. B and C only, the um, estimated useful life and salvage value. That is correct. Partial years has nothing to do with it. All right, and then we'll answer question 50. Um, what are the three depreciation methods? All of the above. Good. All right. And then 51, under the double declining method, at the end, book value must equal to... Yes. Yes, remember, I even put it in here. Book value must equal salvage value. Cannot be less. Okay, so that's even on your actual review sheet. So please, I'm telling you, use it. Okay, so good. All right, so then we'll just leave the rest to for tomorrow. Okay, it's going to be a quick and easy one since there's only two depreciations that I actually require you to do. So without further ado, since it is 11, um, 11 go ahead and have yourself a wonderful day and we'll continue this tomorrow okay
<laughs> you still got tomorrow. 